Okay, everybody back. So um, <clears throat> the, the fun thing about this text is that it then jumps straight into emptiness. So normally, um, <laughs> normally we do all sorts of um, love and light and love and light and compassion and wonder and all of that wonderfulness first, um, which is a wonderful approach, but sometimes it's fun to do emptiness first and see if by looking at emptiness, if it kind of opens up a space for compassion to arise kind of genuinely. So um, it can be really interesting to kind of experiment which, with um, your own mind is, emptiness kind of your access point into dissolving afflictions or his compassion because it'll be both but sometimes they'll alternate so this text does emptiness first so it's quite interesting um we'll just have a look at it for a second number two the main practice training in bodhicitta first it does ultimate bodhicitta then it does relative so ultimate bodhicitta is bodhicitta the mind of enlightenment in the mind of someone who's realized emptiness perceptually. Relative bodhicitta is bodhicitta from a relative perspective, from the perspective of a conventional mind. So the ultimate bodhicitta verses are the most kind of poetic of this text. Um, so let's just sit with them for a second and see how they resonate. And then I'll unpack them a little bit and then we'll do a meditation. So, the first point under the main practice training in bodhicitta, consider all phenomena as like dreams. Examine the nature of unborn awareness. The remedy itself is released in its own place. Set the entity of the path on the nature of the basis of all. In the period after meditation, be a child of illusion. So, so before I go into what the commentary says, what is the saying? Just using your own study and your own logic. When you hear something uh, say, examine the nature of unborn awareness or see everything is like a dream, what is that leading us to understand? kind of a, a poetic way of saying what we say technically all the time. Um, but in what way are things dreamlike? Yeah, enough, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say emptiness, but I don't know if that's what you meant. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, it's definitely saying emptiness. Um, and, you know, but it's like, how do you, how do you bring what you understand about emptiness into walking around life? You know, we kind of understand how we're supposed to work our way into an understanding of emptiness, either intellectually or on the cushion. But how are we supposed to look at emptiness when we're talking to people? You know, how are we supposed to understand emptiness when we're reading the newspaper? You know, how, how are we supposed to look at emptiness when we're observing the thoughts in our minds? What is the way to kind of bring it forward into daily life so that we can start to pierce the veil of illusion? And these verses, I think, are particularly useful for remembering emptiness in daily life because um, they're kind of short and pithy and um, they get straight, straight to the point of things. Um, you know, consider all phenomena as like a dream. How are things like a dream? They're not ultimate. They're relative. They're, um, you know, it's not the ultimate truth. It's like a dream, like an illusion, actually created in our own mind that doesn't make it real. You know? Yeah, exactly. And, and similar to a dream, you know, you can, you can be afraid in a dream, you can be happy in a dream, you can have a whole lifetime in a dream, and then you wake up and you realize it was just your own projection. And that doesn't mean it didn't happen. That doesn't mean it didn't have an effect, but it's not real, you know, you broke the spell. You know, you woke up and you kind of were like, oh, wow, that was intense. Anyway, <laughs> and, you know, the difficulty is that if you live in this way and you think in this way, you can go too far and think that 
consequences don't exist or that karmic cause and effect doesn't exist or that there's no such thing as good and bad or right and wrong when all of those things do exist conventionally they just don't exist from their own side and these teachings are very much a private conversation these are not things to say to other people you know you might say to other people especially if you're much older than them or in a position of authority, you might say to other people, treat others the way you would like to be treated. You know, you can say things like that, especially if you're, you know, a grandparent or something, you can say that, but don't say, uh, see everything is like an illusion, unless people have um, enough spaciousness and enough context to hear it the right way. Because either they'll think you're crazy or it'll make them go crazy. You know, it's one of the, like, what do you mean? Everything's an illusion. Everything is dreamlike. What do you mean? And it's, it's that it appears to exist from its own side. Things appear to exist in an obvious way, in a way that is like self-evident. That's how they really seem. And we're not pretending that's not how they seem. That is how they seem. You know, you see the news and some people on the news, you think that is a good person or that is a bad person. <laughs> Those are correct words. Those are incorrect words. That is truth. That is lies. And it all seems so self-evident that when someone else interprets differently, we're shocked. How can you think that? What I see is so obvious to me. How can it be obvious to you? Well, if it was self-evident, every, everyone would believe it exactly the same way. If it had a self-existent reality, everyone would believe it in the same way. So, you know, this, these are really private conversations to help make you Dharma rational, not just worldly rational, but like Dharma rational. And to help you not like chase the bait um, you know, like uh, right now I'm staying with my family and they have two cats and, um, and they like that little string to be pulled around and they chase the string, but especially if the string has like a little ball on it, then they chase it all over the place. And, um, you know, it's like, it's a way of the humans being entertained by the cat behavior, right? And the cats sort of being entertained. And I was watching the cats, you know, playing with this string and this ball and, thinking this is how we are we're like chasing the bait and then we get it and we're so excited and then we're like oh it's not even what I thought it was it's just a ball of fluff you know the cat's like this is not a mouse how dare you you know <laughs> but I mean it's like we're a bit like that like we're chasing and chasing I must have it and then you get it and you're like oh it's not what I thought and so these these slogans help you not take the bait of, you know, you watch the news and you feel triggered and you feel reactive and you feel this is right and this is wrong and something must be done. I don't know what to do. Overwhelmed, tired, click, you know, then that's like half hour of your life you're never getting back. You know, this is what we do to ourselves, isn't it? And it almost feels like we're supposed to get worked up when we see things that are irrational rather than seeing that everything has a rationality from its own viewpoint and there is no self-existent truth. And yet there is still a relative truth. And so looking at the middle way and looking at shinata in particular or emptiness in particular, this is a way of making you live in balance with relative truth and ultimate truth. We need to start with negating or saying what isn't the case, even though we want to stay away from the two extremes of superimposition or denigration, adding too much or subtracting too much. We want to stay away from those two extremes. But what we normally do is we add. So we're not as prone to subtracting. So because we add, we need to start with subtracting and say what isn't there. What isn't there is a base reality. Yeah, what isn't there is a self-evident self kind of truth that everyone's going to agree on. And so when you look at these little points, you just kind of look for the one that really resonates for you, the one that's going to like unlock it. So when you consider all phenomena as like dreams, then you don't have to pretend that there wasn't a drama. You don't have to pretend that there wasn't emotion. You just stop believing that projections of your own mind are actually there out there as they seem. 
Does it make sense? The middle ones are less clear, and so I'll read the commentary for the middle ones. But the last one, in the period after meditation, be a child of illusion. This one is very significant because what you're saying is that when you're in meditation, you're seeing an absence. You're seeing a lack. You're seeing nothing asserted in the place of things not being inherently existent. You're seeing kind of a, an idea of infinite possibility and spaciousness. And then you have to get up and like drink a glass of water <laughs> and it's all becoming concrete again. You know, you have to, you feel your limbs moving to go get the glass of water. You feel the texture of the water on your tongue. And then you're supposed to be like a child of illusion. And what that means is that child mind that is very curious and not certain that everything is just as it seems and has that like, why, why, why mind, you know, like little kids have, how come, explain it you know, why? And it's like whatever answer a kid is given when they're in that developmental stage, they're not usually satisfied. It takes a long time for them to be satisfied. They're like, why is the sky blue? And you explain some scientific reason. And they go, huh, why is the sky blue? And you explain some poetic reason. And then why is the sky blue? And you give them a religious reason. Why is the sky blue? You know, and they just still keep asking because they're actually just living in this kind of openness of possibility of in a way, anything can be anything or everything is everything. And it's not like they've realized emptiness, but there's a kind of spaciousness in our mind when we're a little kid that, um, you know, you could take a chair and decide it's a hat, you know? <laughs> you could take a shoe and decide it's a boat. You know, it's a lot more fluid. And so when you're a child of illusion, you're having that kind of like playful curiosity that is not certain that things are as they seem, yet acknowledges their function and uses them. You know, you're kind of living in that balance of, I see this is a cup, I see that there is water in it, I can use it for this, but it doesn't mean it's that. Yeah, and then you start to see your own life drama in that framework. You know, you start to see your own, I don't know, health issues in that framework you start to see your own relationships in that framework. And you can say, it could look like I have, I don't know, an aging relative who people are not clear whose responsibility it is to look after. And there is some conflict because we're not sure whose responsibility it is. And that is causing divisiveness in my family. Okay. Something like that, something very universal that happens to a lot of people. And then you take a step back from it and you become curious and you say, what I have labeled as divisiveness, could it be actually labeled as clarifying? You know, could it be labeled as an exploration of adult dynamics now that we're all in a new situation with a new conflict happening? Can we reassess our family dynamics? And this is actually freedom. This is not prison of who has to look after this. It's a possibility of who gets to, et cetera, et cetera, right? You can see it a million different ways. But the point is, is to remember that um, options are available to you as a child that become less available to you as you grow up. When you're a child, you will make friends. Yeah. As an adult, less so. It really takes a lot for us to make new friends after we're an adult. When you're little, you're just kind of like, what is your criteria for friendship? Someone in my general age frame who is sort of around me, let's play. And yeah, there'd be differences in closeness and distance, but there's just a lot less criteria for what needs to happen in order for there to be connection. And things like sharing become a lot more natural because you see the cause and effect relationship of if I share this, it creates bond and connection and trust and they share that and it's all interdependent. And there's the kind of beauty of play and sharing, you know, on a good day when people aren't being bratty, right? So just remembering to be a child of illusion is this really interesting headspace that is recommended for once you get off the cushion to pull what you've understood into your life. So then the middle ones, which are a bit confusing, I'll just go right to the commentary for that because I think it's the most clear. 
And there's differences in translation choices, and there's a few versions of this text, so just kind of know that. But basically, there's the first one, consider all phenomena as like dreams. Then in the orange it says, examine the nature of unborn awareness in the orange. And the commentary says this second line refers to the, connect, the technique for establishing the lack of true existence of the consciousness which apprehends things in such a way. So the consciousness itself that is observing and labeling and deciding, that consciousness itself doesn't have inherent existence. And then the remedy or the solution or the antidote or the healing, the remedy itself is released in its own place. Place the essence of the path on the nature of the basis of all. So the third line indicates the means for comprehending the lack of true existence of even yourself, the investigator. So the, the way we're to read this section is to read it as everything you need for healing exists in the very place of your pain. Everything you need for wisdom exists in the very place of your ignorance. There's no need to go to a different part of the mind or a different mind or a different place. Everything is right there at your fingertips. And so the remedy itself is released in its own place. This is one I say to myself a lot when I'm looking to outside habits and activities to kind of self-soothe, you know, to get myself back into some equilibrium if I'm stressed. I say to myself, the remedy itself is released in its own place. And it's almost that thing that happens where Nothing has to change at all, but you've created objectivity with your own subjectivity. Yeah, you've created space with your own train of thought, and then your own train of thought opens into more possibilities, or the tension around your train of thought dissolves just by seeing it. It's, it's like what happens when you remember the backstory of something that normally gives you stress and that you've worked through and that doesn't give you stress if you remember a certain thing. So it's released in its own place. Like, uh, like for example, here in Montana, it's fire season. And so if I see smoke, then I'm a little bit worried, you know? And so then there's the stress of worry of seeing smoke and fire. And then if I remember, the neighbors sent us a text message saying that they're burning the ditches on purpose in a controlled way at this time, then that memory makes me release the anxiety in its own place. The smoke hasn't changed, the fire hasn't changed, nothing has changed. The stress is released in the very place. You know, oh, this was intentional, this is safe, this is contained, stress relief. So similarly, like in our daily life, when you get hooked into an assumption of truth about your own storyline, then you're almost bringing this light of wisdom to it and just kind of shining it and it goes, oh, but not from its own side. Oh, not all by itself. Oh, not in and of itself. And then the story just kind of goes, oh. yeah? And the stress kind of goes, and it doesn't mean there's not still the story or the potential for stress, but the anxiety around the whole situation releases when you just bring that light of wisdom to what seemed a concrete truth. When we talk about the six perfections, um, you know, generosity, ethics, patience, joyous effort, concentration, wisdom. Wisdom is like the I, and the rest of the perfections are like the body. So it's like the body works and functions and is necessary for getting all sorts of good work done, but without the eyes, it's missing a specificity. Yeah, it's missing a directness. Um, and so with wisdom, everything else functions better. It doesn't mean you have to stop your daily life. It's just bringing the eye of wisdom to everything. So, so what, what do you think about kind of that little section, that little chunk of ultimate bodhicitta? Did I lose anybody? The remedy is released in its own place. Yeah, this is the very thing. And 
it's the sort of thing that I think we do with very close friends or maybe our spouses um, when we're talking about some issue and they're listening really well. Not the times they're not listening, but the times they're listening really well um, and filling the space with compassion. And you say the whole drama of whatever work problem or whatever it is, and they're just listening intently, kind of holding the space with compassion and acceptance. And then at the end of your whole rant about how frustrating work is, you're fine and it's fine and there was no need for a solution. They didn't need to solve it. You didn't need to solve it. Just by saying it in the presence of love it's no longer a big deal. You know, when that, those good times when it happens, you know, with a good friend or spouse, right? So what we're trying to do is to bring that observer quality that we usually give to another person, we give that to ourselves. And we kind of hold the space for our own story with love, with acceptance and the eye of wisdom. And you can say the whole story to yourself of your stress, of your worries, holding it in a, like a container of wisdom. And then it's just kind of sits there as, yeah, that's one way I could look at it, <laughs> or that's one element of truth, but it's not even a real story or the whole story or a necessary response to the story. And it just, whew, the edges soften. Does that make sense? So you don't need to realize emptiness directly for emptiness to be useful understanding for you to have. That's, that's the key, is that of course when we realize emptiness directly, that's gonna be amazing and it's gonna help us cut the root of samsara and so many eons of negative habits and amazing, amazing, amazing. But even a very basic, imperfect knowledge is enough for you to stop chasing the bait of your afflictions and your sensory awarenesses. You stop chasing the bait. Yeah. May I ask something, or just if you can verify, you said, um, if I understand right, the, if we understand emptiness, so it's related or connected to bodhicitta, to, because you said like a few sentences ago, what is, you mentioned bodhicitta, and, but we are talking about emptiness. We are talking about ultimate bodhicitta. Ultimate bodhicitta is the great compassion, right? So just, yeah, no, it's an important question. It's important to clarify. What we're talking about is ultimate bodhicitta and relative bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is the mind of enlightenment, right? Bodhicitta is the main Mahayana motivation. It's the intention to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings, right? That's bodhicitta. The right. intention to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. Now that is for us a thought, but for a bodhisattva is a main mind. All right, so for us it comes and it goes, we have to stop and think about it, we have to reintroduce it. But for a bodhisattva it comes naturally and it imbues every other thought. Then we bring in emptiness and once a bodhisattva has realized emptiness directly, when they're realizing emptiness directly, that is ultimate bodhicitta. It's bodhicitta in the mind of someone who's realized emptiness directly. Right, so it's like their emptiness becomes qualified by bodhicitta and their bodhicitta becomes qualified by emptiness. And that means they're living in the perfect balance of being able to work with ultimate truth and relative truth. And once they become a Buddha, they can see both simultaneously. But before that point, they're able to navigate both sides of the story without going crazy, without adding too much or negating too much. Okay. So, so great compassion is a step before bodhicitta. Great compassion is wanting all sentient beings to be free from suffering and deciding that that is your job. Regular compassion is just wanting all sentient beings to be free of suffering, full stop. You know, and like, you'll help when you can. You know, <laughs> if they're in front of you, you'll give them a cup of tea, but you're not like proactively working on your path in order to be of benefit to them. So great compassion is deciding it is my responsibility to help alleviate suffering. And then from great compassion comes the thought, well, how do I do that? 
how can I relieve someone else's suffering? You know, I can inject them with morphine, I can give them a cozy blanket, I don't know, but I can't take their suffering, right? And so then you think the best way is if they could train their minds. The best way for me to train their minds is to offer them the Dharma. The best way for me to offer the Dharma is from a place of enlightenment myself, so it's done in an unmistaken way that has the best chance of getting to their mind. You know, then their suffering will be relieved. So, you know, enlightenment is this process of really deciding that your path helps everyone. Yeah, that the, the more work you do on yourself, the more direct your benefit on others. A regular nice person without a particular spiritual framework might go around being very helpful. You know, they might give lots of food to the food bank, you know, and they might give lots of money to charity and they might be the best neighbor on earth and the best listener and the best spouse. And it's all kind of going out, going out. And it is helpful, but it's symptoms relief. You know, it's like giving someone aspirin for a brain tumor. You know, it might help their brain tumor not hurt so much, and that is a kindness, but it would be better if you went to medical school and understood how to get out brain tumors, you know, and in the meantime, you're not giving anyone aspirin, and that's poignant and sad, but you're learning a way to actually take out the problem rather than just soothe the problem. And if you're a bodhisattva who hasn't realized emptiness, then, you know, you're Perfections are really well in order, you know, your generosity, your ethics, your joyous effort, etc. You're really doing amazing on your path, but it's still easy to fall into the trap of believing what you see. You know, of believing your own opinions, of believing your own labels. So we're trying to get into the habit now, even before we're bodhisattvas, we're just aspiring to be bodhisattvas. Maybe some of you are, but you know, this to get in the habit of as soon as you land on a conclusion to, to, to kind of release from the conclusion. As soon as you label something, to release from the label. It doesn't get rid of the label or pretend it's not there. A stop sign still means stop. But you know, it's, it's kind of noticing that the stop sign didn't tell you to stop. You told yourself to stop because of those lines and image, you know? This is, we're just kind of changing how we understand what we see. Because it does seem like everything is telling us what it is when we're telling it what it is. And then believing it's coming from the other way around. And then blaming it for that, <laughs> right? Or praising it for that. Oh, you've made me so happy. I need you in my life all the time. Oh, you're so obnoxious. You need to get out of my life. You know, it's like, well, we put that there and then it fed back and it was like yelling into an echo chamber and wondering why it's so loud, you know? So ultimate bodhicitta, this is, um, this is the really huge Mahayana training because we're wanting to bring them together from the very beginning. They're usually seen as separate projects, bodhicitta, wisdom realizing emptiness. But here we're trying to, from the very beginning, put them together. And then once you have them together, then you could like, give food to the food bank, give money to charity, be a nice neighbor, and all of those things, but not fall into the trap of thinking that you're the grand savior of the universe or the neighborhood. You just know that these are manifestations of an inner mentality that you're trying to cultivate all the time. And that inner mentality is gonna have a million different expressions, and the expressions are not the point. The inner mentality is the point, then whatever you do is going to be useful. Does that make sense? So it's just like shifting the emphasis from outside work to inside work, and then you'll wind up doing outside work, but from the right place and with less burnout because you're not so invested in immediate worldly outcomes. You know, when you're invested in immediate worldly outcomes, you get tired because they don't happen quickly enough and it's two steps forward and three steps back and the world's going to hell and the environment's falling apart and everyone's mean and, uh, you know, and you're trying to fix it, fix it, fix it. And if you actually just kind of go, going in, organizing the inner, 
then whatever you do externally is going to help the external world, but it's not the point anymore and you don't need to solve everything. So it's not like permission to not vote, <laughs> right? Or to not be engaged in the world or to, you know, not be involved with society. It just means that you know that samsara is not fixable and that the manifestations of samsaric minds are not fixable. And just like for you as an individual, the, the remedy is released in its own place. For us, the samsaric environment can abide in the same place as the pure land. You know, and it's very much about what the mind is tuning into and inviting out. Yeah, what are you, what are you projecting? What are you speaking to? What are you inviting? What are you calling towards? Because everything exists all together in a big mishmash, you know? So what you speak to is what you invite. Just like what you speak to internally is what you invite. It's amazing. So, you know, yay seven point mind training. Um, I, you know, I, I love it so much, but it's, it's something that, uh, it's not easy, but I think the fact that they're short and pithy, there's one or two that'll just stick with you and then stay with you. And that's, that's what we're trying to get to. Yeah, for it to stick and stay, one or two that then help you release the seriousness of your afflictions and come back into balance. So um, we go into then relative bodhicitta after. So then you're not going to be a fundamentalist about your relative bodhicitta. You're not going to get obsessed with outcomes. You're not going to um, feel like a fixer or a healer or get some big identity trip about your helping activities. Um, then you can do Tonglen and not be a weirdo, right? So if you've thought about ultimate bodhicitta first, if you've thought about the wisdom realizing emptiness and the way everything is illusory, then sending and taking should be practiced alternately. You should begin by taking from yourself. These two should ride on the breath. This is the instruction for Tonglen practice, for giving and taking practice, which is, um, often just an invitation for fundamentalism because people think too literally. But the thing is, if you let go of literally, sometimes literally can happen, right? So, okay, so you're in front of your dear friend who's just been diagnosed with cancer and they have all sorts of stress and emotion about their diagnosis and you're doing Tonglen for them as they tell you about it. You know, you're breathing in their suffering, you're giving it to your self-cherishing thought, you're sending out your happiness, connecting with bodhicitta. Just in your head, just on your breath, quietly while they're in front of you. What can happen is that you become so oriented towards them and so not triggered or stressed by your own pain of the situation or your own need to fix the situation that you relax and create an atmosphere which is a powerful condition for them to relax. If they are deeply relaxed, that becomes a powerful healing condition for their body. And if they have the karma for it and the genetics for it and the physiology for it, their cancer might actually shrink because of a deep stress relief and a deep soothing. And so it's as if you gave them that, but not in as direct a way as your meditation is doing. You know, your meditation is saying, literally, give me your cancer, give me the stress of it, give it to me, send it to my self-cherishing, take all my happiness, everything good I've ever done, may you have all of it, direct and literal. But you're remembering with emptiness that the gateway to emptiness is remembering dependent arising, right? The gateway to remembering emptiness is seeing that everything is empty because it relies upon causes and conditions, parts and context the basis of imputation, the mind labeling. It relies on so many different things. That's why it's empty. If it weren't empty, it wouldn't need all the layers of dependent arising. Yeah, so, you know, so by doing Tonglen, remembering emptiness in the background, it's still very simple and direct, but it can have this effect on them where it actually is a powerful condition for their healing. But you didn't breathe in their sickness, <laughs> like, no more cancer, right? but people can get too literal about it because occasionally it has a literal result. 
So you're not the cause, you're the condition, but conditions are hugely significant. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, gently, gently. So it's just living in this balance of cause and effect exist and everything is empty of inherent existence. Yeah. Good and bad lead to happiness and suffering. And there is, things are only good in a certain context from a certain perspective, merely labeled by the mind. Bad is only existing in a certain context, merely labeled by the mind. So it's there, but not there. And then you relax. Yeah. And if together with that, you can bring in just even a basic understanding of consciousness, Right, then, you know, if cause and effect exist and consciousness exists, then consciousness must also rely on cause and effect, right? Which means that mind has a substantial cause, a previous moment of mind. Nothing comes out of nowhere. We know that from the natural world, which means this consciousness has existed before this body and this consciousness will exist after this body. And so if this body goes to dust, oh well. <laughs> Oh, well. May it nourish the earth. May it feed some worms. Oh, well. Change in clothes. Yeah. Gently, gently. So just, uh, you know, we sit with this, but remember that even though emptiness is such a Buddhist concept, that it exists in so many other frameworks. Like, um, like I have this Einstein quote that I love, right? You guys probably know this quote. Um, so Einstein says, a human being is part of the whole, called by us, universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings, as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to enhance all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. Right? So he experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical illusion of consciousness. And this delusion is a prison for us. Right? That's a scientist, right? Not even Buddhist. Right? He gets it. <laughs> Right? Or there's a, um, a famous Virginia Woolf quote that is, uh, nothing is ever one thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. right? So, you know, kind of work your way into it, however works for you. But whatever can break this spell is going to be useful. Okay, so we're just going to sit. Um, sit with a couple of those and just kind of see, see where it's going. <laughs> and then have a little short break. <laughs> 